Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. We're going to start the book of Joel tonight. Uh, the main thing I'm going to look at tonight is, is the date. And that being said, it's kind of hard to establish a date, uh, but I'm interested in at least making a presentation. It could be uh, from the days of Hosea, you know, 760 B.C., uh, Amos, because that's where it's, uh, the book of Joel falls between Hosea and Amos. The Jews have a traditional, uh, their, their, their tradition is, or their idea is, that it was in one of the older books from the days of Hosea and Amos. Um, modern theologians, not liberal theologians, but as they've looked at it, they've moved more towards the, the post-exile, meaning when they came back. And because of some things I'll show you tonight, Many of these books are referred to or quoted potentially, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, this is a, a reasonable time to put it here. Uh, it's not absolute. This is where I lean towards, and uh, it's kind of what I was interested in before we started the book. Is kind of was I going to teach it over when I taught through Amos and Jonah and and those other books, uh, or was I going to put it here towards the end? And I decided towards the end. Um, what I'm going to do, I think. I, I, I think we will do this, is I'm just going to read straight through it, three chapters, and uh, see what happens, just so we can hear it. Uh, some things that I want you to look for or listen to uh, is, one, there's, there's a locust invasion, and now is that locust invasion an actual uh, locust invasion, or is it a metaphor of an invading army? I think this is an actual locust invasion that takes place, uh, and it is uh, a reference to, it's, it's a judgment taking place on the land. And in the book of Joel, one of the things that happens, and I think we can do this in our own lives, it, uh, even the book of Hebrews says, uh, consider hardships as discipline. And that, that book of Hebrews says that. It's like, it, what's going on? Is this, is this God? Is this saint? Is this my mistake? Is this just accidental? It's like, he just makes a blanket statement. Consider it discipline. If it's God doing it, if it's a satanic attack, if you made a mistake, if it's just life, whatever it is, you use it as discipline and work through it and learn something from it. And so this locust invasion in, in Joel... He's calling it a day of the Lord. And that's going to be a theme of this book. In fact, that could be the theme of the book is the day of the Lord. And, it, I mean, are we projecting this out towards a day, the day of the Lord that's going to come someday in the future? I think when you read the book of Joel, and we're going to read through it, you see the day of the Lord is there's many days of the Lord as far as there's going to be the ultimate day of the Lord, but this locust invasion is God's judgment on the land of Judah during Joel's day, and the people are wondering, well, what are we going to do? And it's the day of the Lord. Judgment is coming. You need to repent and get right because God's allowing this to happen to wake you up. But yet, it's a reference to the day of the Lord. Someday, something like this is going to happen where an army is going to come in and do the same thing to the land, a, a different event, a real army. It's going to be just like this locust evasion, and the people of that day are going to have to repent, just like you are going to have to repent in Joel's day because of the locusts. They're going to have to repent because they're being overrun by this eschatological event. And when they do repent, that's when the Spirit is going to be poured out, and then there's references of rain, and the seasonal rain coming to re rebuild the crops after this day of the locusts. Well, after the day of the invasion of, by this eschatological army, there's going to be an outpouring, a refreshing of the Spirit coming on the land. And then there's going to be, and we'll look at the outline of, of the book next time, uh, the northerner. The northerner uh, is some kind of a commander. Now, is this... Uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, is this, you know, uh, Sennacherib uh, coming out of the north of Syria, Babylon? Or is this the Antichrist coming out of Gog, uh, Magog, uh, out of Syria or something in the future? But this is going to be referred to in, in two different times, and he will be defeated in this book. So those are some things you're looking for as we read through this. Uh, both, it's speaking to Joel's people of his day, this 
an actual locust invasion, I think, but yet it's a warning in, of, of a day coming in the future. And uh, you'll hear many things, and we've gone through many of the prophets already, and you can hear some of these words, and I'll refer to them later here when we get to the notes. Let's see if I can read through this quickly. It's three chapters of Joel. Uh, and in just a moment, you'll realize why they don't do this kind of thing in church with large groups of people because they would just people would just leave in droves as you got into the second chapter. But when I get done reading, I look up and you've all left. I understand. But here we go. The book of Joel. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Bethuel. Hear this, you elders. Give ear all inhabitants of the land. Now one thing for tonight I'd like to have you listen for is when does this sound like it's being written? Is it sometime, can you tell, is it being written during the days of the kings, during the days before the Babylonian invasion, or is it after the exile, the return to the land? Is it deep in this time? Are there walls of the city? Is there a temple? Where's the kings at? And the first thing you notice right here, there's, I see, I can't teach, I gotta get, there's no mention of a king in the, in the title, the subscription, uh, or superscript. And the leaders are the elders. So that's interesting, just in passing. That's the kind of stuff you can look for. Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the cutting locusts left, the swarming locusts have eaten. What the swarming locusts left, the hopping locusts have eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, a powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off the, their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lamb it like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The field, fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, wail, O uh, vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Verse 13, put on sackcloth and lament, O priest. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes, it is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouse, storehouses are desolate, the granaries are torn down because the grain has dried up. How the beasts groan, the herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them, even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame, flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Chapter 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their light has never been before, nor will be again after them, through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. 
as with the rumbling of chariots they leap on the tops of the mountains, like crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn by the battle, drawn up for battle. Before them peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale, like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each on his way, they do not swerve from their paths, they do not jostle one another, each marches in his path, they burst through the web burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city, they run upon the walls, they climb up into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who ex executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and do not and, and not your garments. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave blessings behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber, between the vegetable and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep, and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make, make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain and wine and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Chapter 3. For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people, and have traded a boy for a prostitute, and have sold a girl for wine, and have drunk it. 
What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? If you are paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily. For you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried my riches, rich treasures into your temples. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. Behold, I will stir them up from the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your payment on your own head. I will sell your sons and daughters into the land, into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a nation far away, for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations, consecrate for war, stir up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords, and your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say, I am a warrior, hasten and come all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit in judgment all the, summit, all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. And Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, oh, and, water the, and water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall become a desolation, and Edom a desolate wasteland. For the violence done to the people of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge the, their blood, blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. There is the book of Joel. So again, like I said, next week we'll go through and provide an outline. Uh, not just a structured outline like we may have, like, you know, just how it flows, but make some connections back and forth through the book. Now, on the notes, again, we're talking mainly about the date of Joel when it was written. And, again, I'm going to share some clues, but you can argue both sides of any of these clues, and you should. Uh, I'm going to set the date sometime here after all, after the return, after Haggai, Zechariah, and Ezra had written, Esther and Ezra, even after Malachi has been written, I'm putting Joel here, as the Greeks are rising, the Persians who were friendly to Judah uh, are, are fading away. I'm putting it right about here. That's, again, not an absolute answer. And someone even considered it a mistake to even suggest a date. Just read it for what it is. But the way I think, the way I, 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 I present this, the way I teach it is, I like to have a background. I mean, who's, who's writing it? <coughs> who's reading it? Is there, are, are they before, before the Babylonian captivity? Is there idolatry in the temple like it was before Ezekiel and Jeremiah wrote, and they wrote about that? Or is it after the temple's been rebuilt, and they've tried to purify it, and now they're going back into uh, some kind of a decline uh, we saw that in Malachi. Malachi is telling them uh, to, to bring the tithe into the storehouse. So there was a decline, maybe Joel's, something like that. Interestingly, it, it begins by saying, uh, nothing like this has happened. Do you, have you ever seen anything like this happen? Well, now, if you go over to you know, 586, they saw a great disaster. So these people coming back, returning to the land, uh, uh, coming, you know, as when the Persians release them in 539 and they return, if it was written during this time, of, of course that they can remember. I mean, some of them remember Solomon's temple, so they remember the burning of Jerusalem. So it can't really fit here. I mean, it, it could be before, and they don't remember anything like this happening, but it can't be these people because some of these people could remember that. They can even remember the captivity. 
So it's almost got to be far enough away where this is a distant memory. Now, that's some ideas. We'll see some more things here. Number one point at the top of the page. The book involves a plague of locusts or a locust invasion in Judah. And I think this is taking place in Judah. Uh, the interpretation of this is challenging. I can, we, we will talk about that more. I mean, is there two events? Is this all about locusts or are the locusts being used to refer to an invading army? Is this eschatological, talking about the distant future? Uh, again, does it represent a human military invasion or is it an actual locust invasion? Does it have an eschatological reference in any way? And I think you're going to have uh, a contemporary reference to the locust, but it's being compared to the great day of the Lord that's going to come eventually, and Judah eventually is going to be judged and then eventually brought back. Because at this time, whenever this is being written, Israel is still scattered. You understand, just because they came back from Babylon in 539, you still got the ten tribes that were scattered in 722 B.C., uh, and and those, that, those promises of like Hosea and Amos, the restoration, as you know, many of those prophets, the book ends with a promise of restoration. Just because they return from Babylon doesn't mean that has taken place because they're going to be dispersed again in 70 AD by the Romans. So this, this re ultimate restoration isn't taken, hasn't taken place historically, and it definitely was not going to take place in Joel's day. Point two, one of the overreaching themes of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. There's five or six times it's mentioned in there, and we'll look at that. And again, is that going to be one specific time, or is there several days of the Lord being mentioned? And it is a day of judgment. Sometimes it's a day of judgment on Judah. Sometimes it's a day of, of deliverance. But when it comes time for the day of judgment on the nations, it is going to be a day of salvation and deliverance for Judah or the people of God. Uh, the person Joel, we don't know anything about Joel other than this book. He's not, he's not mentioned in Scripture, and we know his, his name, uh, his father's name. His father was a believer because the name Joel means something similar to Elijah or the, he belongs to God, he is the Lord, his, the Lord's name is in his name. So his father was a believer of some sort. You know, he, he named his son after Yahweh, um, and that's all we know. One of the things that's going to be interesting, and I mentioned it already, is there's no historical reference. It doesn't say in the days of Josiah or during the reign of Uzziah and, and you know the kings here or there. It just, it just has Joel's name. And I'll mention it later again. One reason may, that nothing else is given there is there's no kings. There's no one there that they could mention. But also... The Bible is being, again, this is, you guys understand, some of the stuff I'm saying is speculation and may not, it, it may not even be worth mm. saying. But at some point, especially during Ezra's time, Ezra was a scribe that was kind of putting things together. Uh, during, it was during Ezra's time that uh, the synagogue was established. Uh, they, they had the temple was built, but they needed to have teaching going on, and so they established synagogues scribes that would begin teaching and, and explaining the Word of God. It was a time when Hebrew, the language of Hebrew, had been replaced by the Aramaic. And even in Ezra's time, when he read the Scriptures to them in Hebrew, they had to stop and let someone interpret it to the Hebrew people in Aramaic because they didn't speak Hebrew. It wasn't their common language anymore. So many things were taking place here, including the aligning of the Scriptures, of putting things together. It's not unscriptural, it's not unbiblical to say that Ezra and some of these scribes did some editing as they put the books together. And you have to admit that, just like at the end of the book of, uh, of the writings of Moses, it makes a comment about Moses' death, explains what happened. It's like, well, who wrote that? I mean, Moses didn't write it unless he's prophesying about his death. So you see some editing. That's not a higher textual criticism. Higher textual criticism pushes the Bible to the place that it was all made up. It was fabricated. It was something the priests were using to manipulate the population. It's, it's not even based in fact. That's higher textual criticism that destroys the scriptures. But to realize the, the scriptures are uh, authentic documents written by people, inspired by God, leaves plenty of room for a scribe to come by and write down the ending of the book of Chronicles because 
the end of the Chronicles, book of Chronicles, it even talks about the people returning. So it, it appears that someone from this side went back and wrote the ending to Chronicles to kind of cl close the book down and put things together. So again, that's not that's textual criticism, but not in the sense higher textual criticism that's destroying the scriptures. Nonetheless, some would say, and it's worth considering, that Joel was written at this side of the scriptures that people knew who he was. I mean, they've got all these books, and there's Joel, and it's, he's the son of Petul, and they just had it right there, and they put it in the, in, the, in the text with the other, what they considered scripture. Again, that may not even be worth mentioning. Um, the date of writing. The date of writing is debated and it, it, because there's no real clues. And you may have noticed some clues as we read through it, and I'll point some things out. Some claim it was written before Hosea around 800 B.C. That would be about as late as you can go, 800 B.C. A more modern opinion is that it was written after the return from Babylon. And so modern scholars, we talk about uh, conservative scholars, they're, they're considering this time period now for the book of Joel. The Jewish tradition is that it was back in the days of Amos and Hosea, around 760. Especially when you see where it's put in the Bible. I think I've got that written down. Yeah, point D. Joel is arranged early in the order of the minor prophets between the book of Hosea and Amos. So it goes Hosea, Joel, and Amos. And as you know, Hosea was written, uh, we, I taught, sometime between 760 and 710. And then Amos, who follows Joel, was between 760 and 754. So that would put Joel right around 760. So that you'd have three books written around 760. And that's kind of hard to argue with because you, he's, he's surrounded by on both sides by someone that wrote 760 B.C. in that time frame. The problem, not the problem, but one thing that undermines that, the book that follows Amos, so it would go Hosea, Joel, Amos, is Obadiah. And Obadiah is clearly written in 586 B.C. after the fall of Jerusalem. So you got 760, 760, 760, and then 586. So, and then you got then the, it's all scattered. So again, there's some it's, it's worth looking at that. That's where the Jews placed it. Did they place it there for chronological reasons? Well, then why did it's pretty clear when Ob Obadiah was written? Why did they move it back at least after Jeremiah and Ezekiel? It doesn't seem like they're organizing the books in some kind of <coughs> chronological order. Maybe more in themes, and that that kind of helps explain why Obadiah is where it's at because. The, the ending of Obadiah is similar to the ending of, of Amos. Um, and you can see the difference there, the swing. I got the years written down there. Uh, and the point E, Joel is not mentioned. Okay, it doesn't mention any kings or historical references. Okay, now I've got, boy, oh boy, I've got two and a half, three pages here of points on when or why you'd consider Joel to be written this, uh, this point, this part in, in history on the time scale. Uh, we've read through the book, so some of these things you can refer to them. Sometimes I'll go back and read them. But number one, the first thing we've already mentioned, often kings, the names of kings are mentioned in the opening of the book uh, where the name and the family of the prophet are identified. Here there are no kings uh, that are alive or reigning during the time when Joel was written. So there's no kings. So that would fit. That would fit with this. There's no name of a king because there's no king ruling and reigning. Uh, number B, or letter B, the authority in the city of Jerusalem in Joel's day is not a king, but elders and priests. This would seem to refer to a time after the kings and thus after the return from Babylon. So you've got elders and you've got priests that are mentioned. So the priests are up and functioning, which means... And you saw it already, there's clearly a temple. They're talking about offerings that they can't bring in because there's no grain offerings, because the locusts ate everything. They can't even do the temple services. So there is a temple. Uh, there is an altar. The people are called to assemble in the temple. The priests are, are functioning. In fact, they're called upon to mourn, to weep, right out there in front of the temple. Uh, contrary to what you saw the priests doing in Ezekiel's day. In Jeremiah and Ezekiel's day, the priesthood was totally corrupt. They were persecuting the prophets. Ezekiel 
uh, has visions of how idolatrous it was. Going back to Isaiah's time, Isaiah, the king Manasseh, uh, brought in a Shira pole, so the temple was totally corrupt. So it's hard to see it being back here because these priests are being called to actually do their work, kind of like Malachi calls the priests and the people to do their work. So it, it fits with that. And there would be elders and priests. Again, there was elders and priests throughout the Old Testament, so that doesn't mean that puts it there. Uh, interesting point C, the northern kingdom of Israel is not mentioned. Uh, again, it, it fell in 722, but there's no mention of Judah and Israel. There's no mention of your sister Samaria. Like a lot of times the prophets, they'll refer to the two different kingdoms. Uh, it goes on and says, uh, it's not mentioned as being in existence or as a historical memory. Sometimes the prophets closer before the Babylonian captivity, they says, remember what happened to your sister or look at Samaria. They, they're pointing it as an example. They're not even talking about northern Israel or Israel as an example. In fact, the word Israel is used but not in reference to northern Israel. See, it used to be Israel and Judah. And that's what confused you at some point in your life. I know when I was a teenager, I'm reading through the Bible, and you're reading about the kings of Israel. And then you read the next part of the chapter, it's here's the kings of Judah. Well, who are the kings of Judah? Well, it looks like they're in Jerusalem. Well, who are the kings of Israel? I mean, what are, what are they doing? It's like, can we, I'm completely confused. And then you finally realize that there was a separation. There's the northern kingdom of Israel. Well, in this book, Israel's addressed, but there's no confusion. It's like Israel is not mentioned alongside of Judah, northern Israel, southern Judah. It's just Israel, which means, again, it appears there's no distinction any longer. Because when they went into captivity... Because of 722 with the Assyrians coming down into Israel, those northern ten tribes, many of those people fled down to Judah. And that's why Hezekiah had to expand the wall. They brought the people in. And so all 12 tribes were in Jerusalem and in Judah, members of them. So many of them got taken captive or dispersed, but there's representatives in Jerusalem. So when Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes Judah captive, all 12 tribes have representatives in captivity. So when they come back, representatives of all 12 tribes come back. So there's not really this idea of all well, the lost 10 tribes. It's like we, we've only got two tribes. Well, no, they fled into Judah. They were taken captive to Babylon. They came back and repopulated. And so you have all 10 tribes functioning in the post-exile, functioning during the Maccabean time, and even there in Jerusalem during Jesus' time, you've got members from all the tribes. Now again, there are still the Israelites that were dispersed in 722, wherever, however they, wherever they're at, that's another topic. So there is going to be a gathering of people of Jews in the end times. But nonetheless, uh, it goes on and says here, words common among the prophets such as Ephraim and Samaria, referring to northern Israel, are missing in this book. Also, Joel uses Israel to not refer to the northern Israel, I already said that, but to the whole united nation of that time that is not is no longer known as ten tribes to the north and two tribes to the south. It's just Israel. D. Walls of the city of Jerusalem are mentioned in Joel 2, 7 through 9. You can see that we read that, but here it is. Like warriors, they charge like warriors. They scale the wall. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. So if we are considering this is taking place in the city of Jerusalem, uh, it's talking about walls. Now, if you make this eschatological, it's sometime in the distant future. That doesn't mean there's walls in Jerusalem in Joel's day. It, it means in this prophecy, this event, there's going to be walls that they're climbing upon. But let's just say these walls are being used because there's walls in Jerusalem, because there's a temple in Jerusalem, there's people coming to gather in Jerusalem, uh, there's walls, we're going to assume. Those walls fell in 586. They were not rebuilt. They're still in rubble all the way up through the return, all the way up the temple is is built in, in 516 it's finalized 
and the, the walls are still in shambles all the way up until I'm looking for Nehemiah. Where's Nehemiah here? Am I looking? Uh, the there he is. There he is. He's up here. So all the Artaxerxes, you're up here in the five, 445 before the walls. So if there's walls, it has to be written on this side because there were no walls after 586, no walls until Nehemiah comes right here. If you're going to use that, and there were, the people say, well, there were still remains of walls, and they try to put something together, but no one's going to run on the walls when you can go through the gaps in the walls. So again, that's a tough one to use, put any teeth into, because they're talking about possibly an eschatological event. Uh, but the walls, if they're talking about walls, they have to be after this time period. Uh, and I've got all those dates. Jerusalem's walls were tore down and not rebuilt between the years 586 and 445. So Joel was written either before 586 or after 445 B.C. Uh, e. The temple was built and in operation. The temple again itself was destroyed in 586 and rebuilt in 516. So again, it can't be written, it can't be during this time period. It has to be at least after 516, or it's got to be before 586. And here's the reference to these right here. All right, I didn't write that down. Point F on page two. Israelites are referred to as captives and exiles in Joel 3, 1 and 2, being sold. And here's the verse. For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Notice he's going to restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Before 586, those fortunes hadn't been lost. Again, this could be definitely, I think this is an <coughs> eschatological verse. And I'll enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel because they have... They have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land. So, again, that would definitely be after 722, maybe even after 586, but it's a day in, a, in, in the future when he's going to gather them back. So they're referred to as fugitives. Point G, again, that's not a very solid one to prove anything. Uh, G, the whole nation could be called up on to assemble in Jerusalem. We see this right away in Joel chapter 1, verse 14, when it says, I've got it written there, point G, Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. Again, this is because the locusts are invading land. The, the food is gone. Uh, the, it's, we're in trouble. They're in serious trouble. And it's a day of the Lord. You're going to have to respond to this. Like Hebrews says, consider any hardship discipline. Just consider this fate as being from God. Either God allowed it, God caused it, but nonetheless, you need God. So let's call an assembly and, and mourn and seek God. And they're telling the people, Gather the elders and all the inhabitants to the, of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So they're going to they're calling for apparently a national assembly. Now we saw that take place in Hezekiah's time and Josiah's time, and when everyone would come. But this is particularly interesting because it gives the impression of how it's being said is that it's possible for this small return community in Judah to everyone can show up. Again, when in Hezekiah's day and Josiah's day, they're talking about way up in, by Galilee, they're talking about people coming from all around, and not everybody's going to be able to come. I mean, we're talking about the entire land of Israel has population. Here, it would be possible for all the inhabitants to gather. And again, there's no mention of kings. It's the elders and the population which could make sense that uh, this would be taking place after the return and the city's been reestablished. This is very interesting, I think. Point eight, H. Joel quotes other prophets. Uh, so either Joel is using the former prophets for reference, terminology, and as a source, or the prophets that follow Joel are using him. Either Joel is on the other side of Isaiah, and Isaiah, and Obadiah, and Zechariah, Zephaniah, uh, oh, oh, what did I say else here, uh, Malachi, are all quoting Joel, because he wrote this great book, one of the first minor prophets, or Joel is on the tail end, 
well acquainted with and writing in the style of all the prophets that have come before him. And here's, and again, these are all not like crystal clear quotes, but you can definitely hear the flavor of what is being said referred to in Obadiah. So you've got to decide, and it, it, you don't need a right or wrong answer. It doesn't need to split a church or something, uh, as far as your opinion. Uh, but for me, it's easier, once because this is kind of what I want, where I want it to fit, it's easier for me to see Joel being familiar and quoting all of these, kind of using them as a collection, than for Joel on the other side to have all these great sources and everybody drawing on it. So here it is. Um, the first one I've got in bold under uh, point H. Obadiah 17 is quoted and introduced with by, by, uh, by uh, Joel. Uh, he's quoting Obadiah, but he adds the phrase, as the Lord has said. So he quotes apparently Obadiah and then says, as the Lord has said. Similar to what I might say or you might say when we say, as the Lord has said, and then we quote something out of 1 Corinthians. It's like you're quoting something that's recorded. Uh, and here, here's the reference. Obadiah's words in Obadiah 17, but on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and Jacob will possess his inheritance. When Joel writes himself, and again, that's we read through Obadiah, and there is talking about there will be deliverance on Mount Zion. You're going to go through all these situations, but there will be deliverance on Mount Zion. <clears throat> that's, what, that's what Obadiah's point was. Joel writes, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So again, there's room to see how he's referring. He's saying it's already been explained there's going to be survivors, those who are going to escape and survive on Mount Zion. Now watch this one. We know that both this, this reference is in Isaiah and in Micah, and the famous millennial verse, where they'll take their weapons and turn them into farm equipment. Isaiah writes, He will judge, speaking of the Lord in the millennial kingdom, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Now, Micah says something very similar, a few differences in the translation. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Talking about the millennium, when, when the Lord comes and rules and reigns with a, with a rod of iron, he'll solve their disputes, judge fairly, and it's like they'll realize we no longer need weapons of war because the Lord is in total control. It's a total uh, authority of iron rule. No sense for, let's use all this equipment for being productive. Now watch what Joel says, and you read it already tonight, Joel 3.10. He says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. So he reverses that, says there's a day coming before the kingdom age, when the Lord says we won't need these weapons anymore, is you better stop wasting time farming and start making weapons and protect yourself because war is coming. So now you've got to decide what came first, Joel or Isaiah. Is Isaiah, because Joel's this great prophet in you know from 760 BC that says, get ready for war, stop farming and, and turn your farming equipment into weapons, that Isaiah and Micah say, ah, I see a day where we won't have to do what Joel says. We'll just take our, our, our weapons and turn them into farming equipment. Or is it the other way? Have they prophesied of this great day and Joel saying, it ain't yet. You better get ready for war because the day of the Lord is coming. And he's talking to the nation. So anyway, that's clearly, I think, uh, it's such a familiar phrase even in our own world that you, Joel can't be quoting that without referring to Isaiah or, and Micah, or vice versa. Micah and Isaiah can't be saying that without having in their minds Joel. 
I think Joel comes second after Isaiah and Micah. And then you got to decide who came first, Micah or Isaiah. Who, who said it first then? It, I mean, in a, in a discussion, it's not a huge issue. Other quotes. Isaiah 13, 6. I will read off the uh, notes what the prophet says, and then we'll read out of Joel what is said in the, in the book. So I'm looking, i got the book open here. Isaiah 13, 6. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Joel 1.15 says, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Similar, again, not a direct quote, but you can see the ideas are there in the terminology. Ezekiel 30, verses 2 through 3, say something like this, and it continues. Wail and say, Alas, for that day, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near, a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations, and it continues. And Joel 1.15, we just read it, very similar. So you can see there Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Joel are all talking similar terms. Zephaniah 1.14-15 through 15, The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 say, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is a spread upon the mountains and great and powerful people. And then Malachi 3, 2, But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or launderer's soap. And Joel 2, 11, For the Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Kind of maybe picking up on what Malachi says. Not an exact quote, but the same idea. Malachi saying, who can endure this day? It's, it's like a refiner's fire or launder or so. And Malachi just, or uh, Joel, reduces it to, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? And meaning, you've already read Malachi. We have already know this is a fact. Uh, and then Malachi 4, 5. Uh, Malachi writes, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And Joel 2.31 uh, says, uh, I wish he would have used the Elijah reference, but he doesn't. He says, I'm looking for a 31 here. The sun shall turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So those are, is there one more? No, that's another point. So those are the references that we've got that correlate. You can kind of see, again, one way or the other, it just seems that Joel, it, it, at least there's a lot of the other prophets in the book of Joel. And it's, if you'd allow me to think this thought, it seems that Joel is very familiar with these other prophets and he's making his point for his community on this particular day. And he's drawing on all these other prophets referring, almost rehashing what you already know and indicating how they should respond to this locust invasion. Uh, on the, our last page three, uh, point I, it says uh, the Jews were sold as slaves to the Greeks in Joel 3.6. So if you notice right here, I've got right here during the days of Artaxerxes, that's about the time I'm putting the book of Joel. And if you look right up here, that's the rising. Greece is not, hasn't destroyed Persia yet, they destroy it right here is where Alexander, but right here Philip, uh, Alexander's father in 356, is making plans to go to war against the Persians. And the Greeks have come across, they've crossed over into what we call Turkey today, and they're on the coast and they're kind of occupying that land. The Persians are trying to invade and they have. Xerxes has invaded, Esther's husband has invaded uh, Greece. And so Greece is now rising with the intention of destroying the Persian Empire. So the Greeks are, they haven't taken total control, but they're definitely moving. And this just mentions that they've been sold. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Notice Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks. So that's the people that have returned. They've returned to Judah 
and are surrounded in Jerusalem. And they've been sold to the Greeks. Um, another point, just it is, a, is weak, but it's, it's also at the same time, it's something to be said. Angels coming with the Lord in judgment occur in Joel 3.11. It says, bring down your warriors, O Lord. There's, there's, there's angels throughout the Bible. The Lord is called the Lord of hosts throughout the Bible. But particularly, beginning with Ezekiel and Daniel, you see a lot of references to angels coming and speaking. you got names of angels in the book of Daniel. And even if it's true or not in the book of Joel, it is during this time period in Jewish thinking and their theology that the idea of angelology developed. And so when you get to Zephaniah, where we got Zephaniah here, we're looking for Malachi, Zephaniah, or Zechariah right here. Um, angels are giving him messages and he's, he's getting information from the angels. Uh, and so if it's fit that there's a reference to angels here, Again, not a great point, but it's worth mentioning. Um, point K should probably be eliminated. I wrote that down, but I did some more study on it. And the original language includes words and phrases from Aramaic, uh, but some other scholars have proven that that's, that's not. They are, but they also go back to the Ugaric text. So once you get into all those Semitic languages, there's references, and that's probably not worth mentioning. Point L, uh, there's no mention of empire enemies. The guys like the, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire. Now, of course, the Persians were not enemies of Judah. They helped, they set them, set them back. They helped finance the temple. They sent Nehemiah back for a 12-year period to rebuild the walls. So the Persians are an enemy. But there's no mention of them, but there are passing mentions of... Uh, of some local enemies like the Philistines or the Phoenicians, even the Egypt, Egyptians are mentioned. Uh, one more point, point M. Sidon and Tyre are mentioned in uh, Joel 3 verse 4. It says, What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? And he goes on and talks there. Uh, Artaxerxes III, right here, he uh, crushed the, the city of Sidon in 345, and Tyre was destroyed by Alexander the Great in 332. That's that great story, uh, prophecy in the book of Ezekiel, where he actually builds a bridge out to Tyre and the island and drags it off into the sea. And that, that bridge that he built has built up silt now, and it's actually a peninsula. And that takes place in 332, the destruction of Tyre, and then in Artaxerxes, it's not totally destroyed, but weakened to the place that they're ineffective. Uh, Sidon is destroyed in 345. And so that would mean this verse, Tyre and Sidon, almost give us, it can't be, Joel's got to be written before, right here, Artaxerxes. So this would be like the last moment it could be written because Sidon is going to fall and Tyre is going to fall in the next, you know, 20 years. Or... That you know, in the next few years after writing this, and so this would be your extreme here, and you're going to have a temple is going to be built right here in 516, and then the wall is built by Nehemiah. So you're looking in this frame right in here, potentially, uh, when it's going to be written. So those are some proofs when it's written. Again, that is not absolute. If you had someone else come in here and teach this, they could flip all that stuff around and convince you. It's on the other side. So that's that information. Just so you know, this is where I'm going to present it. That the Greeks are rising. Uh, the temple's been built. The walls are built. Malachi's already spoken and called for some kind of repentance. Joel's coming back and he's able to say, uh, you've never seen anything like this. You're seeing a locust invasion like you've never seen before. You're going to want to remember this and tell your children and they're going to tell the next generation, four generation gives out because we are dealing with something that we're unfamiliar with. But it is the Lord bringing judgment. We need to repent, go to the temple, and there's a day coming where the whole nation's going to have to repent again. And then he talks about the great outpouring of the Spirit. So we'll go through and give an outline next week, not just a step-by-step -step outline, but kind of how some things correlate in the book and a few other things, and we'll eventually teach through it. So I appreciate you being here. Thank you for 
coming out to hear the introduction to Joel. Father, we do thank you for your truth. We thank you for the chance to be here. We ask that we may take these things and allow them to penetrate our hearts and change our lives, that we may live a life that is pleasing to you and effective in producing fruit at this time in history. We do pray for our nation. ask that we may see a time of refreshing and revival in our own land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here.